about moving up, changing hats, and working with Zealand Rowing. And Jared and I are presenting a New Zealand Rowing Coach Education module. So, this is what I'm talking about today, is very much in line in terms of the technique with what New Zealand Rowing teaches. Uh, not surprisingly, because if you look at the head coaches, Gary Hay and Noel Donaldson, we share a lot of background. And in terms of technique, there's nothing I'm going to say today which would surprise any of the New Zealand coaches. Some of the things about how I teach it may be different. That's on my head. What I'm going to try and do today is talk about how to row well and how to teach good rowing, which are not the same thing. Um, and as Jared said, this is being recorded, and I do a bit of writing for a website called rowperfect.co.uk, which until recently was owned by a couple of people in Auckland, and it's now just been sold to a Swiss a German who lives in Switzerland. It's a proper international business. And if you go on there, you'll find a few of my writings there, um, some free, some for sale. And the new owner is much more entrepreneurial and wants to get on with this and do it properly. So he's asked me whether I'm interested in being part of a professional setup. And I've said, oh, yeah, sort of. Um, so what we're experimenting with here is whether recording a lecture having the notes, having it available online is useful. So that's what I mean. Jared's much better with IT than I am, but neither of us is exactly expert. That would be a fair comment, Jared? We've got a backup of a backup here, yeah. just in case it all fails. Oh, okay. Okay, so I'm going to present what I call a model, how I think people should row in a perfect world. Talk about how you grow well, which is not how do you achieve that model, and how I think we should coach that. Now, we mostly pretty much agree on good rowing. I don't, can anyone tell me whether that's actually this year? It's obviously either last year or this year. I've got Sam steering it. I think that's this year, and they've just won the. The um, gold medal at Lucerne, so they're pretty damn quick. If we were standing on the banks of Lucerne, the bullshit point, um, which we go past, we'd probably all say, Yeah, that's not bad. Yeah, yeah, we can recognize that. Do you know bullshit point? Bullshit point, there's a bullshit point on every rowing course in the world. It's where, it's where the coaches all stand. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, so we watch them go past, we say, yeah, that's pretty good. This is Hamish Bond. No, it's not, sorry, it's Alice Bond, because it? it's a little bomb on a rope erg. And we probably also agree that that's not bad. If our 15, 16 year old throws like that, we'd be reasonably happy, I think. Okay. So, before we get into the model, I want to talk a bit about my concepts of coaching. Um, a couple of you were coached by me on the urge this morning. I didn't once say that's wrong. And one of the things I try and do on coaching on the water or on the earth is never to say someone that's wrong. And it's, it's a mindset I have that I try and teach better rowing. So I'm faced with rowing, and I, I, I try and teach the rower to be better. I dislike Correction. 
I don't think it's a good concept. You're all familiar with Hamish Bond. You all watched him row, watched videos of him row. Does he row perfectly? Okay, so you, you're giving Bond a Murray coach. Do you fix faults in Hamish? It's definitely when you look at Eric and when you look at Hamish, there's definitely several differences there. Trying to who they are. Yeah. But you know, Eric's normal. Uh, Eric's normal. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. 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 Think, yeah. He rushes the slide, I think. But um, I, A, people respond better to a positive instruction, a very old one. If I say, right, nobody think about elephants, stop thinking about elephants, don't think about elephants, elephants running through your head. Whereas if I say, think about giraffes, the elephants disappear if you're thinking about giraffes. So, classic one, don't rush the slide. You're introducing the concept of rushing the slide. You can say, slow the slide down, take time down the pool. It's a positive thing. Socially and from a teaching point of view, positive is more used than um, don't give up. Yeah, don't give up, yeah. For Christ's sake, relax! Um, if you're involved in the teaching, coaching, monitoring, mentoring world at the moment, there's a lot of talk about um, ego or um, mastery. That's very intriguing. I talk about it as rewarding effort rather than performance. You get a bunch of 15-year-old kids, most of, most of you are coaching 15, 16-year-olds, right? So, so pretty soon you're going to be doing the first day of the season. And you'll start to be quite a good one. And you're going to have four or five ordinary ones, and you're going to have three or four plenty of awful ones. Um, I would suggest strongly that you talk about effort rather than performance. Because telling a good girl that she's good doesn't really help much. And it's tough on the slow ones. Whereas if you can praise effort, they're more likely to come back tomorrow and try again. Whereas the, the little ones know they're slow, so why should they try? Whereas if you're giving them praise, support uh, for trying hard, then there's a chance they'll come back tomorrow and try hard. So try to avoid, uh, try to re uh, uh, avoid praising the good and, try and praise trying hard instead. The kids know when they've done well. They know when they've won a race. But they don't always know when they've tried hard. Are we, are we planned? Good. Yes, we are. Great. That's right. Pull up a chair and join in. So it's done with the KV today on the Eat it at your peril. Yeah. No good. food waste in the world. No He yeah. wants dark beer. Oh, dark yeah. beer. Yeah. Sorry. So, yes, I work on the dark beer. Okay. It's dark coffee, mate. It's a long day. Yeah, yeah, you see, I'm going to get another bottle. I didn't get it. I'm going to get it. Yeah, I'm going to get it. Yeah, I'm going to get it. Yeah, I'm going to get it. So, you're not a Kiwi bloke. I'm going to get it. I actually wonder. Okay. Chase improvement. 
Um, the All Blacks have the lovely better never stops. We look for improvement, chase improvement, praise improvement. Better than yesterday is all we can ask for. And finally, if you don't know what happened yesterday, how do you know if today's better? Keep records, write down the end scores. Right. Um, some of you will recognise these drawings, probably hanging, it's probably still hanging in some of your boat sheds. Anyone still got New Zealand Rowing posters from the late 90s hanging around? I've got some boats and I've got rowers in kick Yes. Um, those are narrow rowers. Um, these date back to 97. And they're a series of snapshots through the stroke, picking out things that I think are important. So here we are at the catch, at the start of the drive, and I've named, named a few things that you can objectively measure. Are the shins vertical? Is the low back in good position? And some things you do with the outside hand is the blade there. We go through, I'm not going to go into the detail, but all the way through, and I think we can pretty much be in agreement that the legs push first, the legs keep pushing, and then the body swings, and then the arms draw, anything controversial, we tap the hands down, these drawings are a little bit tight on the shoulder. I need to sway the arms. We straighten the arms. We rock over. We slide forward. So, given the limitations of me and the technology, that's my rowing model, which I don't think is particularly controversial. I was very pleased with myself not to get out of this. Praise my efforts. Okay. So, in my world, you start coaching with a model of what you want. Now, has anybody looked at Mahe and Robbie in detail? Look at their finishes. Can you tell me what you've seen? See? With Mahe? With either or both? Um, Mahe swings back on his quad or leg. It suits him, but we had a discussion at Mount um, Mahe here a couple of weeks ago. Um, that Mahe's actually probably not a good model for what our athlete, athletes to do. We don't want everyone to know like him. He's found a way that works best for him, but if you put him in a crew bar, it's probably not going to suit anybody. It's probably being discussed at Carabiner this weekend. Yeah. Is it trials <laughs> weekend? What? It is. I think it's trials weekend. It is. Yeah, the, the people who haven't been pre selected after this are being trials weekend. Yeah, so Mahe needs a long way back. And what's the sequence like? More or less dimensional? I think what it is. Okay, now Robbie doesn't leave as far back as you say, yeah. What's his sequence of the finish? Robbie does what? That's yeah, sort of, he gets the hands going, but then he's kind of soon, soon he hasn't completed the hands away. Um, pretty pretty uh, yeah, this is a separate rock, right? Yeah, pretty crisp in here. It's a fairly loose finish. Every year. Yeah, because he's got shorter legs, so he's trying to utilize well, he doesn't swing any further. 
his, his sequence of finish is arm to body together. Yeah, um, which you, most of you don't teach your kids. But the point I'm making is there are clearly at least two ways to row a single extremely fast. You know, they're both world medalist class. You know, Mahi, you know, first and fourth. At, at um, so your model is your business. New Zealand rowing suggests the model, which at the moment is still Mahi, of course it's still Mahi. Um, I've got a model here, but the first thing you need to do if you're going to teach rowing is have a clear model in your head of what you want, what you think is the best way to move row. So you have a model, which is how you, how you recruit a row. The next thing is actually to go and have a look at them. And we talked about looking at Mahe and Robbie. Dream world, you're given, you're, you're appointed as uh, Robbie's coach. Um, the first thing you have to do is actually decide how he's rowing before you think about what happens next. And We talked before about Hamish Bond. Were Hamish's boats fast? Was he fast in the single? Was he fast in the pair? Was he fast in the eight? Everything he got in was quick. So, the very first thing is to look at the boat. Is it going quickly? Because we are teaching speed rowing, not Versace. In the end, we don't really care what they look like. We want the boat to be quick. So, very first thing is to have a look at the size of the boat. Now, you guys have got more difficulty with that than most, because the nearest place you can measure boat speed is Karapira. <coughs> There's absolutely no way you can measure the speed of a measure the speed of a boat out here, is there? Well, it, it, well, apart from the fact that salt water, you can measure speed through the water, but what's the water doing compared to the land anyway? Um, yeah, well, the wind, water, salt water. You quicker in salt or sweet water? I don't know the answer. It feels quicker in salt. You know what I said? A series of tiny guys would crack out. I saw a lot of the bugs fire out of the woods that got into the distance, so get deeper into the lake and the fresh water, they were stuck. Give me two beers and I'll carry that discussion on. After you look at the boat, look at the blades, um, what are they doing? Um, I'm sure some of you deal with waving them up before you go in the water. Head con. Do the coming out clearly, whatever. And only then and only then do you look at how your crew is run, how, how the bodies are moving. When you've done that, Say, so, okay, how do they compare with the model? Now, Robbie's the fastest single seller in the world, just won the best race of the year, but his finish doesn't fit with the model. Interesting, interesting situation. What's the most important improvement you can make? Do you try and change the way Robbie finishes, or do you just try and tweak something small which might make a, a tiny improvement. And the same principle applies if you're under 15 8 Quad, what's the most important improvement I can make today? I can help them. And for instance, all coach 15 year old boys who can't rock over one, they roll forward sitting upright. 
bit larger. So, the next question is, what do I need to make that improvement? Now, if Robbie wanted to finish differently, he could. He's quite capable of straightening his arms before he rocks over. But your under 16 kid cannot rock it. You just simply can't do it. So asking him to do it, shouting at him, punishing him for not being able to, is a complete and utter waste of time. So what do you need? You need more strength to do something? More flexibility? Is it a matter of technical skill? Is it because the crew aren't growing together? Or quite possibly, is the rigging wrong? Is it impossible to row properly? Um, you've got a scholar who's short at the finish. Her hands are here at the finish. And you say, row longer at the finish. And she quite legitimately say, well, how? You need to move your feet. So make sure it's, that the rigging makes it possible. So you made a decision about what you want, what improvement you want to make. So then look at what is needed to get that change. What do I need to, to have more of or less of? Next question is, what should you feel like? If you're in a, a coaching boat or on land, some of us it's a very long time since we rode fast, and some people not so long. Did anyone here row themselves? Are there any rowing coaches who never rode who were successful? Yes, yes. Yeah. A number of people who've coached world championship winning crews who even never rode themselves. But if you're going to help an athlete, you should have an idea of what she or he might feel. We talk about controlling the slide. Well, what does controlling the slide feel like? Can you explain to a 15 year old? We think she's really slow coming forward, what it should really feel like. What does the boat feel like when it's going fast? Um, I went out a few years ago in the States with the coach I was there with a, a team, and this coach had just had his stamp, wooden stamp the double rebuilt, and he asked me to go to the first row. We went out, and he was a big, rough, American colleague. So I did a bit of coaching, and the boat started bubbling. Lovely, bubbly noise the boats make. He said, what's that? Is the boat breaking? Said, no, the boat's bubbling. He said, what? You mean bubbling? He'd never had yeah, recognised it. Before. He didn't realise what the boat might tell him. He all rode in a single or stroke seat of a double or pair. What happens to him? No. When you're coaching a single, you can see whether the stern dips, can you? Oh, yeah. no. If you're in stroke seat, no. no. But so if you're if you're in the stroke seat of a crossless boat or in a a, a a single, you can see whether the boat dips. So that's feedback. So you're saying to your 16 year old, don't drop the stern. Maybe you should say keep the stern up, and you can say to people watching, it tells you something. What's the boat to you? What does your body tell you? What does good rowing feel like? We talk about hanging, suspension, these things. What does it feel like? Can you explain to the rower what it feels like? And so what feedback does the athlete get? How many, uh, Tony rows in the dark sometimes? Don't you? you can go out in the harbour. I know the city people tend not to. Have you all rowed in the dark? Cells. What's noticeable? The gear is still. The gear and the part that doesn't. I'm What's 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 coming the other way? Yeah. So you can talk to your athletes about. Do you use your eyes for the time? And a 15 year old say, Yeah, I watch the person in front. He's okay, now roll with your eyes closed. I can't do that. I can go 
to your own time. So how did you get your timing? So think about what feedback the rider might get. We had some people on the earth this morning. Are you rowing one behind the other with a bungee tying you together with your eyes closed? Mm -hmm. yeah. so, so, as I suggested, was you could feel whether you were in time. Sensory to stay in time. Again, pointing out that eyes, eyes aren't important. Blind people are quite well. There are actually some blind schools that have rowing clubs. I had a blind crossing. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, I was waiting for it. Seriously, I, I was running a beginner's day, a Luger Road day in Switzerland in a language I, I spoke very bad. And his parents ended up explaining how their wee kid was an adopted orphan from India, being rescued from some dog in the air, so he rescued from his being a different religion, a different skin colour. And I was like, Do I care? And then at the very end of this introduction, he told me that he was blind. I've got a teacher kid who doesn't speak the language very well in a language I don't speak very well how to row and he's blind. And we had a lot of fun. And I was getting a bit cocky. So I put him in the in, in, sorry, in, in um, the coxswain seat. I said to him, okay. Equal pressure on both hands and you'll go straight. And he was the straightest of all the nine kids that we tried. Yeah. Taught me a lot, much more than I taught him. Um, so yeah, feedback, urge to be feedback. Lots of numbers, are they always useful? All had it, all had it, had stop in the middle of the case because the numbers are wrong, didn't you? Do you train with one crew alongside another when you can? Pretty good feedback. If I row better, I'll go past the, uh, the crew. I use the motorboat a great deal. If I'm coaching out here, I want to make a technical change. I'll pull the motorboat somewhere level with the stern and coach. And hopefully, it's feedback from me as well as from the crew. If something changes and they're going better, the motorboat, the crew move away. So you can say, look at the change, look at the difference. You've moved it away. Alan, I want you to do this. See, Alan, see the difference you made? So that's a very useful form of feedback. Uh, not on there. If you're lucky enough to row on still water, a speed coach will give you uh, feedback. <clears throat> and now, finally, step five, we're ready to practice the skill that we want to do. So we have to think about okay, we want we Johnny to stretch over. And then take more time coming forward. How do we how do we practice that? So there are in-boat drills or exercises that you can use. Um, games, cross training. You don't have to teach rowing in boats. You teach rowing on on land a lot. Some of us were on the urge this morning talking about how uh, you can use the urge to teach technique. In general, on the water and off the water, we teach things. So, summary so far, you have a model, you look at what's facing you, and after realising you really need to copy very badly, you should think about what you need to achieve, the change you want, think about what the athlete will feel, she makes the change you're looking for. And then you think about and set about practicing the change you want. So, I'm pretty confident I do that almost automatically now. So I suggest you think about how you coach. We compare the two methods. Um, <clears throat> what a lot of coaches do, Crew on the water, 
and we rode for a week. Great. Off we go. Bow seat you're doing this wrong, this wrong, this wrong. Two seat you're doing this wrong, this wrong. Three seat you're doing this wrong, this wrong. Down the boat and try and fix things that way. And I suggest that you're confusing the ethics. You're not giving as much uh, motivation as you could. And that you're generally expending more effort than is necessary. So I suggest you try this one. So, to suggest a bit more detail, here we are, catch position, and for the sake of this, my model says shin vertical, lower back in strong position, and the blade placed with the outside hand, sweep, obviously with both hands. It's going. What can you look for to see whether this person is following my model? Look at the boat. Is the stern staying up through the, through the, um, the catch? Are you all familiar with what I'm talking about here? You want confident about that? The idea that a boat is going well, the stern doesn't. So look at the boat. I'm giving the answer away there. What sort of splash would you get off the blades when you go in the water? It's the idea of a V-splash for me. Because I want that, you don't want that, you want that. If you drop a blade in the still boat, you get a V-splash. So look at the blades. <coughs> We've talked about waving the mum. Are the blades going into the water when the body is furthest forward? Also an interesting point. Who was, who was talking about 60 kilo girl rowing in a 90 kilo boat? We were laughing about how little girls often row, end up rowing here. And if you're talking to um, Good run of looking girls that how to do the catch properly. If they're trying to catch up here, very unlikely they'll do it properly. So, uh, is the boat rig so that the handles are out of a respectable height as to the catch? Now, finally, we can look at the, the rower, the rowers themselves, and look at what shape the back is. Have we got a horrible? Bend or have we got a good strong back position? Does that back position stay constant through the catch in and out? Does the back stay as it was? And do the knees, are the knees the first thing that moves? Or the seat? I look at the knees rather than the seats. Particularly if you're half behind the crew, you can see all the knees moving. That's quite a good indication. So, <clears throat> I've decided to have a coaching session based around catch. Those are the things, sort of things I look at back in that sort of order. Boat, blades, rigging, then the bodies. This is taken off from the commons on the, on the web. Has anyone seen this series of photos before? It's British rowing from the uh, early 90s, I think. A woman called Tracy Langley, who was a, a reasonable lightweight scholar. That's the place called Verese in Italy, and it's not out of focus, it's just it's the colour of the air. It's, so, it's like, like our Mahe Ma poster, it's a series of pictures of her. <laughs> so here we are. And the first thing I look at is the stir. She's a, a lightweight woman, so she's also not very big. But the back of the boat is still up. She's just going into the water. She's right at full extension. 
um, and the stern of the boat doesn't drop. Okay, great. The boat is keeping on running. Yeah. Now the blade timing we talked about. At the point of full extension, the blade's going in the water. Yeah, we, we have to agree with that one. Pretty darn good. His arms stretch, his roll right forward, the blades just entering the water. Now we can look at the body position. The chin's vertical, body's against the thighs, back's leaning forward, nice strong back position, great. We talked about the uh, what the blade should be doing. That's a pretty reasonable B splash, especially like front and back. The blade, the uh, shafts are parallel. So there we had two examples of pretty good catches, we'd say. When you face the people that we coach, we'll catch quite that flash. So we think about what we need to achieve a good catch. Uh, does anyone pay attention to how high the athletes feet are on the boat? Or is, it, yeah, is that one of the things that's too difficult because in the morning it takes a long time and you can't find a suit and it the right? I don't know if that's something pretty bad. Mm. <coughs> <coughs> I wonder whether you can't wander around with rocks and rubber stepping on the head. I would advise that's one. Lift your feet up. Yeah, yeah because that you put a size 5 shoe in a, in a size mm. 13 run. Uh, true, yeah. It, it's, we're used to setting the foot stretcher back and forwards. The height and the angle are often more important in a lot of ways. Um, and if you want your people to be in a good position on catch, um, we, a couple of times over the weekend, we've already talked about, if you look at Mahe rowing, he never gets up to vertical, he didn't see things like that, he never gets up here because the speed is too big. He can't get his feet low enough to allow him to get over because otherwise he be like Prince and stuff with his feet out the bottom of the boat. So if you've got a long anchoring kid and the feet are high, there's no way he can get forward. If you've got one of our wee 45 kilo, 15 year old girls, she'll be highly likely over compressing with the shins going right over the top. So right side shoes, like we're talking put in the shoe with the comes the same thing about shoe height and the angle and hide the gate, if you don't have that right, you're wasting her time and your time trying to get a good catch. But that position is relatively hard to get to and very hard to, to stay at. So unless you've got a, a core, a corset, <coughs> you can't even get to that position. So again, if you're trying to say to someone, sit up tall at the catch, and they just can't do it, you're wasting your time. It may be that they're overweight and they can't pick up enough. So what do you, you know, the wall faces the, the pudgy 16 year old, you can't get pulled because his or her guts is in the way. Um, no point in trying to get them through properly to catch until they're a, a, a more slender, which is the problem. So, have a good catch, you have to be flexible, strong, and relatively lean. You have to sit tall, so you have to know how to sit tall. I demonstrated this earlier. My job is to hit. My head is to hit. I'm going to hit. Yeah, so what game? This way, I'm sorry, you have to be If you've got a dancer in the crew, you know, we say, who knows the dancer at the end? Okay, what posture did your dance teach you? That's the posture one. Uh, 
So you have to, you have to be able to do it. If I can't do it on land, I can't do it on the boat. And in sweep or water, you have to uh, rotate your shoulders and this is wide in this case it's been inside out. Um, so these are all requirements for achieving this position. The sculling has to be here. So if your feet are wrongly adjusted, so your front socks and your hands are like this, you can't get it in depth. You have to be able to do that. And finally, right grip. Uh, I haven't specified grip, but I'm sure you know how to think of feather in the skull. Is it, if I'm talking about finger feathering, does everyone know what I mean? Yeah, well, I can't teach you. <laughs> <laughs> well, get, just get Dave to help. Uh, yeah. <laughs> if you're gripping badly, it makes it very hard to get him to catch. So yeah. those are all the things we need to be. We have work for a deviation on that. Sure. Yep. Sweet, because sweet growing, I see a lot of good athletes now feeling their guts on him. Mm. Um, is it because the handles are so much smaller now that it's that less critical than it used to be? And how, how, how much trouble do you go through with the young athletes to try to avoid either of the outside hands? Kind of it's not one of them. I personally go to a lot of trouble to teach. And I believe that by leaving the outside wrist flat, you can, I've just noticed that my jersey's on inside out. Sorry. <laughs> First presentation I gave in Switzerland in German, I was speaking my very best, awful Kiwi German. I spoke to the street. Oh, right. Any questions? Why is your shirt inside out? <laughs> <laughs> um, I believe that if you keep the outside wrist flat, you can hold the pressure just a little longer. It's only, only talking about a centimetre, but every centimetre. And otherwise, that happens and you start rolling a bit sooner. Yeah. I, th I think the new light oars may mean that finger feathering is accessible to almost everybody in the sweet boat now. Mm. Um, but yeah, I, I, I advocate. Uh, a horizontal draw, and that's that's a hook. Yeah. So if you had an international crew and you've got five months to catch him, would you try and fix, try and change someone who was been riding for five years? Um, if it was Hamish, possibly not. Mm -hmm. Partly because he has got a permanently broken collarbone. Are you aware of that? Yeah. Okay. Um, if it was the woman say, was a twenty-two-year-old, yes, I would try and change him. Absolutely. Because it's not just that, I reckon it's quite a big difference between how you're going up the slide. If you're pushing the handle or flowing after it, you and I get learned the same. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> I think, yeah, there's lots of reasons why. Um, and finger feathering has lots of advantages. In sculling, in particular, most of your scullers, sorry, I, I scull the wrong way. Way back in the, at the dawn of time, East Germany, Hauraki, and Walks Bay rode right over left, not left over right. It was one of the, I knew you see it. Yeah. It was one of the big things at the unification of the rowers, that the East had to swap hands, swap hands. All sorts of screws. Most of your scholars have got holes here. Yeah. Because if you wrist feather, because if you finger feather, you can do that. You're out of trouble. You have another reason to think of it. Yeah, I'm. I'm if you, who, anyone play golf? Anyone play tennis? I've got time. So I'm busy riding. <laughs> Good man. Golf and tennis are both sports that have well structured professional coaches. They're nice middle class people like us. Go and learn to play golf and tennis. And your first lesson is about how to hold the stick. We throw kids out of water and talk about what's happened at that end before we've actually told them how to hang on to it. 
as a computer side, the last 10 years is an absolute plague if scholars, the hands are not on the end of the handle. Anyone else notice this? Why do you think? They have been taught. Mm. But what, it must be more comfortable or something, aren't they? Yeah, because like they have little people and they have the people too. Mm. I know it was comes at two plates because you've got the nut on the end. The girls don't like holding it because it causes blisters. That's a fair point. But they, they didn't have fingers on them. And the finger grips on that concept. Yeah. yeah. The clinical one told me under the secret or something. Yeah, I, I'm feeling the progress might be tense. Yeah, we spent hours and hours reading the boat the nearest movie, and then the, the, the rowers hold the handle 25 mils away from where we intended. So, all these things are necessary, you want your rowers to have good catch. Um, and Dave's point, I teach and sweep all the outside out catches. Because I was an idea. Just while you're talking about the catch, would you be able to, especially now that you can get those gates with it does tell you what the catch handle is, would you um, go through and set up a crew and say, I'm going to take quite a bit of time and get it all on the same catch handle, for example? Angle as in that way around. Yeah. Yes. Um, in my world, the first thing you talk about before you join the crew is set the foot stretcher, and I set off the finish, not off the catch. And then if the crew's going to stay together, I alter the catch. How about that? The catch. Um, yeah, we might have a digression. In the old days, we talk about front stops, don't we? People set front stop. The slides used to be short. A bit like that, which is a 1970s, I would think, 1960s, 1970s. Um, the slides only be about that long, so a tall person could hit front hand back. Now, standard rowing boats, the slides are so long, almost no one can hit front hand back. We now have effectively infinite slides. And with shortage slides, the coach used to set front stop where he or she wanted the crew to be at the catch. That was how we did it. Talked about through the work. I think sitting behind the work makes more sense because if we take all, we're an eight, aren't we? Well, you're an eight with the Aaron Cox's seat. If we put you in a rowing boat and tell you to go to the finish position, we're all pretty much in agreement where the finish position is and it's fine. Legs are straight. Back, so one o'clock it's fixed. So you can't really change where your first place position is very easily, but you can change where your catch position is by reaching further or leaning forward further or sitting up. So I set people equally at the finish first step, so they're at the angle I want. And I do that by having a tape on the boat that shows distance behind the work. Anyone that's seen that? Uh, Windex had built in that. Yeah. So I, I, I fit a bit of tape. The instruction is, girls under 15 boat, okay, 59 centimetres behind the work. Or just, you know, give or take, give or take. Um, international men's eight, 65, 66 behind the work. Just the season back then. Yep. And then, and that also means that the crew can set up there quickly. And then I have you and you in the same boat. So you're nice and parallel to finish. You're a great lean, very flexible person. So you're way around the catch. You're short and stiff. So you're short and catch. So we can work on helping you to get longer, and we can compromise you by saying you're going to, you are going to row shorter, which puts you in a stronger position of catch, which is your advantage. Right, that's row the guy in the boat, Yeah, yeah. So I set up off the finish rather than off the catch, is my answer to that one. And given how your kids row in three or four different holes in a, in a, uh, a week, if you have a measuring tape glued in there, you can say, in an eight, you're 61 behind the work, in a four, you're 62 or whatever. You can, or you can even get a bit of nail polish and 
you know, my color's red, and that's where my seat has to be. Good job for parents. Blokes who want to be helpful, handy people want to be helpful. Stick a bit of tape, uh, tape measuring tape in each boat. And do you compromise that sort of back stop position a little bit for the extremes? Yes, obviously. I'm faced with monsters or, or midgets. Giraffes. The monsters just have to finish the early bird, right? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, giraffes and gerbils, you have to do it. The midgets just have to. Well, the other thing is you, you start playing the spread. Yeah, if someone's legs this long and is rowing someone's legs that long, yes. You have to make them much. That's, um, when I say face with arms, I mean the whole arm goes up. The joint does the gap, it's the shoulder thing. No. So, you have an idea of what we need to achieve here. Now, you're talking to your athletes, what should it feel like? We use words like connected to the water. Do you know whether your athlete understands you? You just say, connected. Okay, so what did we talk about this morning, Dave, where we demonstrated how you might help an athlete to feel that? Didn't we stand up on the earth? Oh, okay. Uh, anyone done stand ups in the boat? Can't stand up in, in the boat without you stand up with the blade of water and push your bum off the seat unless you're connected. So if you can lead your athlete through that, you can say, well, that is what I mean by connected. Always too strong. Um, I sometimes use the picture of the cat about to eat a Ready to go. Um, I tend to pick out a row who's doing pretty much what I want and get him or her to describe what they feel. And then uh, use that rather than using my feelings. So I'm aware that my own experience is rapidly disappearing in the rear view mirror. My memory might be um, false. I heard a lovely one I was coaching, some, actually about grip. Yeah. Well, I know, I know I wrote fantastically. Bert would probably disagree. I was talking about how you had to. Hold the sculling handle tightly enough to keep control of it, but not squeeze it to death. The guy said, Oh, you mean a budget grip? I said, What? He said, How do you hold a budget? Stop and escape it, but don't kill it. So it became part of my armor, a budget grip. Lovely, lovely the language. Get the rollers to tell you. Pressure on the feet. Wait on the feet instead of on your bum. What do you mean? Put them on the erg, put them back in the erg, erg up on a beer crate, and they'll feel pressure on the feet. That's what I mean by pressure on the feet. So the core, um, if you're doing standard core work, you have to fly on the ground and hold themselves here to <coughs> deal with sound familiar. Everyone done that? Because the other thing that fingers, his fingers here is a cough, yeah, that's, that's what your core is. Establish a common language and make sure you know what that fits a feeling. I've said before, for Christ's sake, right? Make sure your athletes know what it feels like to have relaxed shoulders and arms. Now, finally, step five, how do you practice this? First thing I said, you had to be strong in the core, so no point in going out there trying to practice a good catch. You haven't got a core program. So your core program is part of your technical program. It's the body, but it's also part of your technique. How often do New Zealand rowers do core? Just... I think so. I think it's two or three hours a week at least. How often do you get stretched? 
training session. You come to the motions. You come screaming down here with mum in the car at one minute past six. Then you're late, you've got to have breakfast and get to school. Do you do any stretching? No. So maybe instead of going out in the water trying to learn something, you're better off stretching. An interesting thought. We're going to improve our technique by staying on land and stretching. Yeah. So what are those demands? Now, here, this is a pretty nice list of exercises. Um, I, that's front stop tap for me. <clears throat> I'm at the catch. I'm just tapping the blades up and down. Normally, at least part of the crew balance the boat, otherwise, I'm pull out. Um, front stop push, just the first 10, 15. Centimeters. Anyone do legs only, right? So from year to year. Good exercise. Sit at half side, blades in the water. Start just half the crew. Gently back down to the catch and then stop the boat and push away. Do you want to use that? Also, let's push back. Yeah. Can lead to strife. I saw the boys' crew thought they were pretty neat, so I back down one, back down two, back down three, and oh, jeez. <laughs> Good fun. So that, those are exercises that I will use, stand-ups I use. And of those five, four can be used on the erg. So, referring back to this morning's session, you can coach quite a lot of technique on the earth. Back and down to the earth on the earth. <clears throat> and what I call an Aussie slap. Slap. Boat rolling. Need with that one? Take a stroke, come forward. And instead of placing the blade, slap it flat on the water. I do that um, just pressing the tips. Yeah. If you do it, yeah, okay. Well, the next step in difficulty is to do it with the boat moving. And <coughs> excuse me. You can see very clearly whether the blade is on the water when the seat stops. And you'll find that they're all like slap. And so in normal rowing, being early, being seriously early is very uncomfortable. But with a slap, you can say, okay, I want you to be early this time so you can actually put the blade on the water before you get there and slither it to the catch. Okay, now be late. Now be in the middle. And again, the athletes can learn to feel seat and blade connected. Seat and blade connected. Um, and play with it. Make more noise! And make more noise! So that's a good exercise. Four out of six can be done. So you're starting to get a bit of a feel about what I'm, the method I'm pushing. Now, this is obviously pretty ponderous, but the whole process becomes quite quick and natural if you do it for a while. Okay. Yeah. Sorry? Sorry? Oh, sure, good, good call, yeah. Let's, let's have a stretch. Stretch, drink. Sandwich. Yeah, good call, Jared. Uh, possibly in the headlight. I'm not sure about this. 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 I'm not sure 
Why don't you start? Oh, okay. You start and then I'll get them to deliver. Oh, okay. Do you want another? Do you want another? Uh, I was, I was getting an email. Yes, please. Can I have a, a long black, please. You're on the heat. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm going to jump to drive three. I don't know how many there are. There are nine slides in my cycle. And I'm not going to keep you here all afternoon. Um, here we are at about half slide. Uh, um, we'll talk about that later. It's, it's a relatively complex um, question. I, I'm not running away, I'm just staying on top of it. Okay, so here we are halfway down the drive, about half slide driven. My simple definitions are the lead drive continues in one piece, you're still hanging off the handle, and the upper body starts opening a bit. So reasonably agreement about that. Some say through the middle of the body starts moving now to the structure. <coughs> so I say what do I look for? Okay, the boat's starting to accelerate because you're at the square off. Maximum power, the boat's starting to move, start to lift a little. Blades cover, we have the rope pass to not. Uh, 45 kilo girl, handle to be below the shoulders, uh, above the shoulders. That is tall, sitting up in the middle of the boat, not hanging out here. All the legs in the boat are driving together. The Eversley Dells first Olympic gold medal, their legs were out of time. Two perfectly matched athletes and the leg drivers together. And they were fast through the world. Why do we buy a picture of The back of our angle started to open with a constant shape. So you, you don't change the shape of your back as you swing it open. And the leg drive is accelerating. We had a physicist here, he might argue with me, but the feeling is that the legs get faster as you go. So that's what we're looking for. Here's an example. I obviously don't know who this guy is. Anybody recognize him? Not everyone at the front. And his body started opening. Right. So his, his body started moving there, his arms are still straight. Good. Oops. So now if we go to Catherine Chiroa. Here we are about, well, this gives an outside. The bound is uh, three quarters gone. So they haven't been photoshopped. They would have gone. Oh, okay. Just like Saturday night in that final. Saturday night in that final. The monster! Um, 
That's the sort of thing we get faced with pretty often. So, Catherine, what, what do you see? Yeah. Boy, it starts here. With very long arms. Yeah, so yeah. he's got really long legs, really long arms, and, and, short mm -hmm. and then he's also making problems with his life. He's short and he's also been unchanged. He's hyperextending his shoulders out. Um, his pelvis is definitely tilted backwards rather than neutral or forwards. Um, and because he's slumping, his handles are quite high. But he is hanging on it, he's he can. Yeah, um, he's actually yeah, he's connected to the water. It doesn't appear to be much of a hole in front of, uh, behind the blades. Um, not a great big power there. So you're faced with a problem. Well, A, we've got a, a road today, and he's part of your program, and what do we do? So you, are you happy to share what you do? How do you react? Or do you want me to go first? If I was back like that, I'd see the same things. The boat looks to be rigged about right. If he sat as if he sat up, and it wouldn't be particularly high, and he is very deep. Yeah, okay. He's obviously very long, so I stop the boat and we've got to get the wee gerbil in the bow and two feet to sit at the finish position together and check whether their parallels were about right. Um, because the striking kid could obviously reach a whole lot further forward than the short one, but I wouldn't want him to because as soon as he reached, he hyperextended his back like that. I talked to him about how he was sitting on the seat. So shuffle the seat down towards his thighs rather than back here, help him sit up. Try and get him to sit up. And if it was a session where I could do it, only row in twos and threes, so it was easy for him to stay as tall as possible. Um, if it was the first time I'd seen him, I would get the crew doing a bit of stretching or core work try a few things like planks and be completely unsurprised when he was as sloppy as a badly set custard in the core work. And I probably then talked to him and his parents separately and say, you've got some catching up to do because your little is floppy. Uh, I'd have a look at his father and mother and see if they had abnormally short torsos or whether they, as I suspect, they're quite big people. Is he a, a one off? He's a real outlet. Okay. How old? 15? 14? He's 15. How big is he? Um, size 15. Pretty good chance his torsos are going to catch up. Yeah. And pretty good chance at the age of 17 he's going to be quite an exciting young man. So. Injury to his body. So he, it looks back, he didn't really get that. He didn't really get a really sore back. That, you'd think someone who rides like that would be in great deal of pain, but he's not actually moving about that fast. Yeah. So there's not a whole lot of um, strain on his body at the moment. But if, if he continues like that, he will lose a really good position. Absolutely. So if we were in East Germany in the 80s, he wouldn't have been allowed to row. He would have done gymnastics, calisthenics for a year until his body was good enough to row with. You don't really have that option. But depending on the parents, yeah, depending on the size of the program, I try and avoid selecting him to race in the top crew and try and do some body development. Um, sort of thing depends very much on the school and the parents. If you can find out whether the parents are rolling in money or struggling, if they're rolling in money, you could suggest a gym membership at a very, I assume you know a good gym where someone could 
Yeah, we have a good street program for the trying to be trying to school out. Yeah. But yeah. Kind of if money's an object, you can ask for some extra extra <coughs> training for the wooden mess. Um, if it's not an option, you try and set it up for him. You have to explain and you start getting into some quite personal stuff about how bodies develop at different rates. And that to have massive feet and legs and arms and high body is quite usual for a pubertal boy. Um, talk to the Zed teachers at school, have a sport about what else he's doing, and is he doing other sports that are helping and getting the same sort of message as you? Because Dad's called him down the rugby once to body. Yeah. Um, and yeah, it's a bit like helping dyslexic to read. We tell heaps and heaps of stories about. Massively successful dyslexics who couldn't read when they were 13. And he will almost certainly be able to row quite well and have a lot of fun when he's 16, 17. But he needs to be patient. That's a whole one on one young coach talking to much older parents, all that sort of stuff, quite tricky stuff. They short term move them on the seat. Tilt the seat forward, work on sitting up, make sure he knows how to sit up, get a hand on the head like that, and try and keep his rowing short enough so he can keep sitting up. Set him some goals, um, erg on erg and mirror. Okay, every time you come to the club, you're going to sit on the erg in front of the mirror and check that I'm sitting up, I'm going to row 10 strokes without something. Tomorrow I'm going to work 12 strokes, 15 strokes. Um, so yeah, first of all, well done for noticing that there's a problem. Well, I said seriously. And then patience and individual treatment, which is difficult. Um, and if your program could handle it when the others are running, Maybe two or three of them should be doing core rather than running because their their problem really is the middle of their bodies rather than their their own That's absolutely fantastic. Thank you. Thanks. That's great. Another another way you can teach good rowing is by jumping from 
you could have them, you could help them into a proper squat position, manipulate the body to some extent, see how far he can go, still strong, he may only get as far as the stage. Yeah. But stop them bending, get them there, and then jump. Okay, one more. Uh, so you can use work on land for that. You can actually manipulate the body to suit. Maybe I'm having a discussion here. I said talking about what you should be feeling. I said that your arms and your shoulders should still be feeling pulled out. You, you said you, you like the feeling of your arms shortened a bit just before the catch. Am I quoting you correctly? Yeah, that, that is part of the placement. Mm. So do they then stretch again afterwards? Okay. I'd say if I was hanging, I was here. I'm hearing you saying that hanging is here. Yeah, I could extend a little bit mm. to allow it to come up to a slight strong push. It's a little bit of a couple of points here, yeah. Slightly different models, but also what I describe might not be what Dave feels. If I'm coaching Dave, and I think he's doing it pretty well, and he described it and I described it, we described two completely different things. So we have to align our language if we're going to be an effective team and coach an athlete. Yeah. <clears throat> and you said hyperextend a bit. I don't like the word hyperextend. So again, we have to, if we're working together, we have to align the language. So it, so I talked about shoulders being pulled out. That might not fit your picture, or it might fit your picture, but with different words. So we have to work on how we communicate. Feeling the seats moving fast. Down here, you can probably hear the rusty bearings squeaking as you drive past. How often are you changing your wheels? <laughs> Yeah, I think probably something that makes sense. So referring back to the VTAC guide, these are things you could do to practice doing this properly. You could do short strokes, so rowing just half slide, quarter slide, half slide, because if you've got it to sit tall. Fair chance you can reach quarter slide and maybe even half slide without having to bend his back. But it's a tactic to full slide. So that's one way to practice it. Um, that's less good. So this one's not much good for that. that can, but normally you practice building the stroke from the catch. We all do the old Eric Craze, arms only, arms and body. I do a lot of it from the catch. Quarter slide, half slide, three quarter slide, full stroke from the catch. And you can practice this. And I do legs only. And now legs and back. You familiar with this as a rowing demonstration? Um, yes, I Stuff the duck. Sorry? That's what they call it. Stuff the duck. I don't know why. That stuff the duck. The whole mechanism for the tap. Okay. Uh, oh, the stuff the duck. I love it. I love it. <laughs> yeah, you coached Melbourne, didn't you? Yeah. It was a it was a Mergen dog guy. I learned that from. Stuff the duck. That's what they call it. Stuff the duck. I never asked him. <laughs> I just said, what I know it is, is doing the track from the catch. But they know it is a stuff of that. You just change it. So, or dumps, I just change the notes. It's just not worth asking. You get yourself. I don't think they actually know. That might have been I hope you recorded that one. Um, I do back only one. Actually, that's a good one. If you consider yeah. briefly, 
Yeah, we've, we've done a lot of that, just um, really short directions. Yeah. It's um, yeah. Um, I, we, oh, we said, we talk about moving the back. What muscles do we use in rowing to move the back? Yeah, glutes and hamstrings. So if I say you swing the back, you're using your bum and your hamstrings. Um, so if you're going legs only, legs only, and you want the crew to use the back, you might have to teach them to squeeze their butt together. Do that. It can be a highly amusing session. That's a feature. Right? Squeeze your butt. With adults, I talk about grabbing the wall So back only row might, might be a way of sort of a specific strengthening exercise. And that's when you can do the boat so all of them do it rather than just him. <coughs> um, you have watched men sprinting? You say bulk or company? 100 meters stuff? What's noticeable about their bodies? If you, you look, at, look at the sprinters in their skin tight suits wandering around before the start. What, what might you notice? Have they got big bums? The sprinters do that. What do rowers do? Good rowers have big bums. Big that way, not that way. Need to be careful, a 60 inch bloke advocating looking at look the, the, the girls' bumps and the bumps the girls' coaching. But the shape of your athlete's body will tell you whether they, they actually use their, their glutes and their hamstrings. If they're not, then they're not applying enough power to it. So a crew that drives properly and opens properly. And if you found an adult, an experienced rower with a back like that, he or she would have no bum at all. They never use it. What you're doing, one of my things about what you're trying to do is to grow some hamstring and bum up. You could also be using games to look at the crew on the water and then look at the crew on the water and say, well, uh, as part of building from the catch, you can do straight arm rowing, so legs and body, no arms. Going to focus on movement in here. So there are all things you can do there, right? I'm going to bail out here. Excuse me, won't talk quite much yourselves. Okay, a um, little bit of through the throat cycle. Finish or start of the recovery. My brief definition there, outside fingers tap down on the way, inside hand relaxes and feathers, or it's going obviously both hands tap down. What might you look for? Boats to win. Quite an interesting game is to have a crew row straight arms, reasonably forcefully. Take your motorboat alongside and say, right, now add the arm rule. Does the boat speed change? Why bother with the arms? It doesn't 
Like Robbie doesn't really. Hmm. I've not seen him up close. So, boats should still be running. Blades come out of the water together and square. With flat, they're all your fingers. Body strong, built to neutral, kind of that old sand stuff. Here's a picture of there is the field of the flag. On calm water, you get a very good idea of boat speed from the ripples of the boat. Are you familiar with looking at, looking at the ripples? See those, that B weight coming off the hull. The faster you're going, the wider it is and the more ripples there are. If you know your crew and the boat, you can get a fairly good measure of whether it's going quickly. Um, yeah. no, I've said there that my hands blades come out together and they're square. I don't know, honestly know if they can square to be honest. So, but, but it looks a bit as if they've come out and it's clear of the water. Not quite cleanly. Yeah. Can we do some finger theory exercises? Yeah, the hands the size of hands. He's still wrist fitting it. Um, I would, if I was coaching Mahi for a year, I'd talk about changing that. I think you can get a little extra off the finish. Be a little more comfortable on the way forward. You might disagree. But you look at him. Although he's leaning back further than Robbie does, he's still in a very strong position. He's not slumped, he's tall, he's well fixed. He doesn't look as if he'd be easy to push over. We talked before about setting the feet properly, and now I've, I've talked there about behind the work rather than in front of the work. In a sculling boat, if I'm in a single, where would you advocate that my hands are at a finish? Up there? Yeah. yeah. And in a quad? Okay, good. We're all in agreement. Quad, double, single. Sweet ball boat. Handle to the outside of the room. It's pretty good measure. You teach kids that when they get the strange boat, there's a, a chance they'll have their feet in more in the right place. Um, why do we sit close to the handles in a quad? Than in a single. So you have to be close to the handles to control them more because it's faster. No, you need a more catching. Comfortable with that idea? In a faster boat, you go further around. Why would that be? A bit of distance to the yeah. yeah. we've been world champions for a long time. Right, way, way. Do you think that people have moved a little further forward over the years? Yes. Since you were on? Yes. Uh, we rode 
huge now. It's huge. So, um, 46, 40 to 60 mil through the work in an eight. And now people are 150 mil through the work. Thanks, Eugene. Is that because they're stronger? Or bigger? It's certainly bigger. Um, they're certainly thinner. Um, the gear is quite different. He is a whole lot stiffer and lighter than we wrote it. Um, it's an interesting question whether people row better today than they used to. Let's discuss belly up to the bar. Um, why, what's the world age record at the moment? Even too much. 518, is it? Something like that? Means like no, it's under 20. Yeah, 518 ish. The New Zealand Eight did a world record in Copenhagen in 1991 at 531 in a wooden boat with mules. So, taken 12 or 13 seconds off in 45 years with new boats, new oars. Um, so, it doesn't really suggest that we're rowing a whole lot better. Interesting. Big so, schools keep coming down every year. Well, yeah, there's a progression in big schools. I'm not just in the record, but um, yeah. yeah. What used to be the subject to something to be celebrated. Yeah. Well, it's routine. Mm -hmm. Um, I've seen risks say to that initially. Even in sweep, I try and teach you to go down like that, then you feather after you're out of the water. Or in the scully. How do I teach? Oh, interesting. Well, <laughs> what? The question is, why well, would you do that? I have no idea. There's a sequence that. Where is the other one? There it is. Yeah. Outside, I advocate the outside of the state's flat in the Crypt State Wisconsin. It's just a hook. Um, there's a good argument we should have spade handles on the end of our sweep walls. So that's a strong position, isn't that? Have a pivoting handle with a D on the end. Go to the gym and try a seated row with that position and with that position. Mm. A stronger like that. It's only that. It's all vertically. I'd like to see placement of those handles. It would be hard, right? That's true. Yeah, place. You know, and what is that strong and neutral? Now, this is where we're talking about feel again. I'm going to cat. coach this. I'll listen to feel equally balanced. And I know a mad inventor who's trying to invent a move which measures the weight on the side of the seat to so see whether they, you sit straight on the seat or not. Tall and strong boys, loose the shoulders, knees split against the slides. Can we talk about that? Two knees down against the slides? Hobble. Hobble oh, the legs down. Mm -hmm. So, against the slides. Big holes in the calves. Move your slides so no holes. This is one I talk a lot. You feel the weighted blade in your hand. And now, there we open your fingers. It's just one. Yes. 
Jeez, we run ourselves too much. We get the rather stuck with our hands, relax the hands, I feel that it's in us. Something like that. It's good in there. Do your fingers open, Ron? Brilliant exercise. Hear that? What do you think about at, at, at our age, and we have enough water time really to do. Yeah, I know. Yeah, that's a final point. If you, we'd love to. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I take a point. Yeah. yeah. I do tend. I spend most of my life on like this water. Mm. But we're talking about this morning. I think about games for understanding. Mm. Say to a group. Single in particular, say to a 15 year old single, okay, I want you to open your hands on the way forward. They'll say, well, fall out. Are you going to be to do off the top? Yeah. You can get a kid to do that on the way forward. They're amazing that they don't fall out. And you'll find that the balance will improve and they'll have some idea of where the handles are because they've probably been squeezing the juice out of the handle because they're scared of falling out. It's a uh, but rather than saying you should relax and you should feel the weight of that blade in your hand, get them to do an exercise and let them learn the feeling themselves. Oh, okay. Yeah. That's not uh, Tasmanian guy, isn't it? Right. Coming close to the end of the time, so. I'm not going to go through any more of these slides. Are there any specific questions about either about what I've talked about today? Because I'm going to come back to one of you, wasn't I? Uh, just, just oh, oh yeah, okay, we'll do that right here. Yep. We teach through the drive leaves, bodies, arms, but if the, the, the lines are blurred, so we're not just going to lead in the use of the bodies and the arms. When do you start to open up? The biomechanics behind that is that around any joint, not that one, but um, you can apply maximum power where the joint is the right hands. Have you got any biomechanics? Maximum power is at right angles. So with your knees at right angles, you've got maximum push. And the general principle. In an athletic movement, is you start with the big joints, big muscles, and move to smaller, more peripheral ones. So you start rowing from the legs, then you move up, then you move up. And to get the maximum power, rather than maximum, or maximum power, you start the next movement when the first one's the right hand. So the answer is roughly when the knees are at right hand, the back moves. From the back end and the thighs of right hand to the arms. That said, what's the feeling about the difference between a lightweight woman's single and a men's eight in terms of that sequence? A lightweight woman will stroke in a single takes a long, long time. So she's much more likely to be almost finished before she starts the next. Get a good men's eight, rating 54. It's just about everything again. It's much more front loaded. We talked about reading through the work the faster. So yeah, big men's eight. Things that press towards the front, force curves are seeker. Things that get Everything gets more compressed, and you're much more, more aggressive at the start of the catch. Lightweight woman can slide the, the, the blade in the water without disturbing the fish, squeeze, and accelerate, whereas a men's eight probably kills the fish at the catch. Other? Or the duck. Or the duck. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, duck. First time I was close to crew. And Netherlands on the boss part, and someone said, I'm going to watch out for fish dunk. I said, Come on. He said, Now, here, you don't catch fish, you catch crabs, and you can injure your athletes. I said, Come on. I know I'm foreign. Right, they have this massive carp, and if you catch one of the cat, yeah, people hurt themselves because the fish has held on to the, on the, the blade. 
think they're about this big and they lie, lie in the sun someday. <laughs> I'm not putting them in. Anything else? Any other particular questions? Well, you'd like to be dancing at the moment. Apparently, the canal's drying up. The heat's just the car. The car will be struggling. Yeah, yeah. yeah the, the weather in Europe is just crazy. Right. Isn't it? right. That's really it for me on this. And I'll just reiterate that that's my model. Your model is equally valid. But I think that process is really, really important. Now, you asked about availability of the slides. Yeah, sorry, I just You asked about availability of the slides. Yes. This is quite a bit of work. It's, it's a lot of work. Right? And I wondered about publishing it. Um, in what form it might be useful. Are you prepared to give me some feedback on, on that? Um, yeah, I'm not like, I guess what I like about this is you get, you've got the image and then three sections of image. I don't even have a word document, three mm. sections of chart. Mm. Yeah, my my dream is to I would find that helpful. That, that I would find that helpful just as a kind of cheap cheap. Yeah. To say, okay, what am I doing today? Is that the moment I that was also you know when you're saying C base and I'm thinking well I thought they were sure, yeah. So my dream would be to have links there, the videos of our exercises, or initially photos, because you know stuff the duck or build from the cats or what I call an Aussie slap or I I bet I've got one I call Russian roulette, and have pictures and videos of them. Yeah. And I want to catch the practice of the the, the recovery of if you have some exercises, click, 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 I I see what he means. So as a coach, and I'm not at your level, I would say, don't, what am I going to do today? Don't, don't. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. And I would, that's what I, what, what I need is kind of cheap. I see yeah. that there's a problem, mm -hmm. because I've done a lot of films with Skype and Catch. Yep. yep. And I've tried the one where they try and splash the girl mm. back. Yeah, they do that. They enjoy that. Yes. You know, it might be one of the other exercises yeah. is something that I could entangle with it. Sure, okay. Um, I don't think I've seen the third one here yet. Um, I've published a little bit on the Robot Perfect website, and that's been amateurish. Friends of mine own, owned it, I wrote yeah. it, they published it, yeah. and we sold them for five pounds a piece, which was more or less free. That's now owned by a, a professional, and I'm wondering about where we go. So I don't know how long I've been on this, but I've spent a lot of time on this. I could spend a lot of time on this and publish it, but then I'd need to charge a sensible amount of money. So I've got a business decision to make about right. Now, what I'd like to suggest to you guys is that Jared makes me up an email list of this group, and I use you as a test group. And you buy my first draft very cheaply and give me some feedback. Does that have any interest? Yep. Yep. Okay, well, we'll do that and I'll contact you in the next couple of days to say yes, I made the promise it will happen. It won't be this week. My life's more complicated at the moment. I'm three quarters through building my own house and, and my mother's just been moving to the nursing home, so life's quite complex. When I get something publishable, the first draft, yeah, right. I am extremely lucky, <laughs> but she fell and broke her hip. So, two weeks out of the last three have been nursing mum. So, yeah. anyway, I'll send you guys the opportunity. We'll go through the website because that's also so the guy who knows it. And I'll talk to him about it being a, a test, so a, a, a very minimal charge. And 
my hope would be that you'll give me feedback and we use you as a bit of a test group. You can have the number of systems like an electronic book. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, e e yeah. Keep it simple, please. Yeah. Okay. I don't know if that was a computer issue. Yeah, um, yeah. So the one of the questions I've got to decide is whether we just publish it in this form or make it into more of a book with some explanation in between and how much and how how big to make it, because you've heard me talking. You've seen about 30 slides out of 90. It's yeah. quite a lot of it. Oh, I was just thinking what you're saying. Uh, Green Miner is just produced and we're running handbook. Yeah. That's the new book. The news on the phone is from when I first started QA to up to date crews as well as telling the parents what we're doing. Um, it's an idea. It's a lot of us got photographs of our crews looked in the light. If you got something that we can carry some colleges of okay, we actually send you mm -hmm. and you can use us say uh, an example of fear yeah. that can be the rest of the group. Yeah, um, it's all possible to pixelate out but here as well. Yeah. So you can have another bit. So I won't, but I could use that baby back boy if we change the color of the shirts and took the heads off, for instance. Yeah, but yeah. I've also put this guy called Steve MacArthur. Do any of you know Paul MacArthur? He's 50 ish. Seriously, he's been taking photos around New Zealand Rome for the last five or six years. He's got rich and bored and two. I'm sitting a few people as I understand. Sorry? I'm sitting a few people as I understand. Yes, yeah, it's an interesting one. He took a photo of a girl. Well, he's, he's, he's has a bit of a collection of people falling out. Well, <laughs> um, and he's, he's published quite a few of them on his social media account. And there was one of might might have been the men's pair, the current men's pair. I think might have been, fell out, and they absolutely laughed at it all the time. And he had some young woman who fell out of the gallery account here, and he was even got her upset. Like the life I published the picture of the poor now. Well, I think she asked what you can take. Yeah, yeah. He yeah. finds it quite funny with the long lens, and he always likes to get the photos of you know, all the gates and the water on one side and the wall of and people getting. Nice guy. Really nice guy. I was too close in the first. That's hilarious. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, three in the same band of Carapira, single in the carrier, single in the double, one bike. 250 of the finish line. Yeah. Yeah, okay. All right. Well, hey, thank you for that. And uh, the other thing is when I email you, if you have a question you think, ah, I would like to ask that. I'm happy to answer the occasional question just in the rowing. Like, being a professional in rowing is a bit easy because we all, you all do so much for so little. And I spent half my life doing lots for a little. Charging very little doesn't sit well, but if you're doing a lot of it, you have to charge something. So I'm happy to answer the uh, occasional question saying, Duncan, what do you think about? And I don't carry a, a data equipped phone, so it'll be tomorrow, not in 10 minutes' time. Do you coach yourself over the summer? Uh, I live 45 minutes' drive from a morning rowing club, so it would be. Deliberate choice? No, no, I retired from rowing. I, no, 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 I just fell in love with the place. Um, so, where are you looking at? That? Central Otago. Well, sounds cold. Yeah. Um, the coldest I've seen is minus 13, I think. Oh. Three weeks below zero. It's too, too full of people. Oh, okay. And I bought um, eight hectares for under 50,000 bucks. You know, anybody wants to live in Central Otago? No, well, just down the road, it's now selling, it's now, it's now selling for rather more. But no, um, three, three buddies who 
walked and fished and lied and drunk booze together for years, decided to retire to central Otago. And then we bought the block and then the earthquakes happened. And Raph and I went down for a winter holiday just to chill out and never bother going back. And I pretty much blown myself to pieces working too hard coaching. I wasn't in good shape, so I backed off. And then New Zealand rowing, no, Southland rowing, which old me and said, I'll come give us a bit of a hand and it's grown. And I do a bit for New Zealand rowing now, as I am tomorrow. And so yeah, and then a friend owns a website, so I, could you write a bit for me? So it's sort of grown a bit. Yeah. So you've grown a lot of I've always, always loved it. It just the life was I was working too hard. I was my health my health wasn't good. And then the earthquake season was particularly tough. We didn't get damaged, but you know, working with damaged kids was pretty hard. Trying to hold the program together. Where were you running there? I was coaching Villa Maria at the time. I had 35 or 40 kids. And and for the RPC as well. But uh, it was just personal. I've always been in love with growing, you know, ever since I started out on the Nara River. Right? Don't, don't usually end up sharing things like that. <laughs> Oh, no, no. Hmm? I'll always wonder what happened then. Okay, yeah. You yeah. Were, uh, the scene, I mean, you were Well, I went up, I spent 12 or 15 years in Europe. Uh, New Zealand rowing sacked five, five rowing coaches in a row, and I was hanging in. I, I could feel cold breath on my neck, so I jumped. <laughs> and went to Europe. I, I spent, you know, same about, spent 12 years coaching in Europe. It's good fun. That's a German thing. Not bad. <laughs> um, the grammar's not wonderful, but I can coach quite effectively in German. I've made the occasional mistake, some of which are printable and some of which aren't. It's really interesting coaching in a foreign language. When I first went, I went to a club in Zurich and they were reluctant to hire me because I couldn't speak German. And the deal was that until I learned German, I Paid, I paid for a coach for the under, under 15s because they had no English at all. And I wasn't allowed to speak English in the club. No one was allowed to speak English to me in the club unless it was a matter of emergency. So I learned German pretty quickly. Yeah. But Raf started as a volunteer in the next door club. And within 10 days, our crews started looking like our crews. And I was coaching with a list of 15 or 20 words. Yes, no, good, bad, legs, back catch and we could affect how our crews rode using a vocabulary that size. Really quite interesting. Is that what made you on the little boats? That was part of it, yeah. Um, and working on Kerr's Reach. There was a, do, you, do you all know Kerr's Reach in Christchurch? A little twisted ditch. With a, uh, we used to coach on motorboats there, out of motorboats. Um, when the river was a bit bigger and there were a lot fewer rowers. And then we changed to bicycle coaching, which is really interesting. It meant that other people could hear you coaching and you could hear other people coaching. If you think about it here, how often do you hear another coach talking? We heard each other all the time. And I got quite interested in looking at what coaches did and which coaches, which crews were pulled up alongside the bank listening to the coach as we rode past and they were still there when we came back. And I started to think maybe we, we talk too much, rode too little. And I watched TikToks in action. Very, very seldom said anything. Seemed to get some good results. And good yeah, yeah. So this is more, yeah. Thank you very much, everybody, for coming. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank Thanks for being a good audience. Um, how many of you are coming tomorrow? Okay. So that's a. Yeah. What time are we starting? Nine. Nine. And we're expecting to run. Nine. Run for. Yeah. Yeah.
It'll be a big day. Bring your bring your scissors and your yeah. Much more sure. Oh, oh yes. Yeah. Um, no. Okay, it, it, it was a massive amount of <coughs> we don't have to do all the details.